Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Ben-Noon with Israeli News Live. This was my Thursday night teaching, and I apologize. I could not do it live. Too much was going on. And it's not really a message about the two witnesses, but the two witnesses are going to come into a play about this, or in play about this message, I should say, but it's more about Romans 11. Now, a lot of the prophecies that I speak about now, especially in light of, gosh, is the book still back here? Yeah, it is. Here we go. I wrote this book years ago, uh, Israel, Are They Still God's People? I'm sure many of you have seen this book. Maybe many of you have read this book. I don't recommend reading it now. I definitely need to do a revision. <laughs> What's funny, I open actually to Romans 11 right there. But the Romans 11 prophecy is not completely fulfilled. Hmm. Especially, because you know, I know that there are, there's a group called Preterists. They believe a lot of the scriptures are already fulfilled. I've always said I'm not a Preterist. Even though I know some scriptures are obviously fulfilled. They're written by the apostles as being fulfilled. And they're still trying to follow the Schofield Zionist theology to put Israel in their homeland, and this is the way that's got to be. All right, so let's take a serious look at Romans chapter 11, and it's going to get involved in the two witnesses, believe it or not. I have a very, very in-depth prepared message for you. I have been working on this now for several days, and we're going to actually start in Romans chapter 10. I want to start in Romans chapter 10 because really and truly it's like Romans 11 chapter 1 is the cliffhanger. It's like, well, what does he mean by that, right? Okay, so let's start in Romans chapter 10. We'll start around verse 18. Um, now, let's go a little bit further. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah, or Isaiah that is, saith Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not, and I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Now he's talking about the Gentiles. And in reality, how does how do the Gentiles provoke Israel to jealousy? They do it by the fact that they actually believe the Messiah. But Israel failed to see it. Now, there were a remnant, as the scripture promises, and we're going to look at that. But not all Israel has come in yet. Let's get going into this. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Then we follow into Romans 11. Let's start back up here at verse 1. We're going to go through each one step by step here, at least certain verses. I say then, if God cast away his people, that's why it says like a cliffhanger, right? You had to know what happened. God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What you not what the scripture says of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, and that, by the way, Elias is Elijah, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, to the, excuse me, to the image of Baal. Actually, the image of is not even in there, just to Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant 
according to the election of grace. All right, here comes our first clue right there. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. You got to remember the scripture says, Paul said in Romans, he's quoting Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah quoted Moses, that Israel is going to be provoked to jealousy by a people of no name, by a nation not known. All those fanciful words that he used there, right? But he doesn't allow all of Israel to not hear. In fact, there's going to be a remnant. Now, I wrote down several scripture. For example, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. Not all of Israel, but a remnant. The second time. that shall remain from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathos, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Now the second time, is this referring, and I believe it is, to the Babylonian captivity? The first time was they were brought out of Egypt into the promised land. And I say it's the second time from there because it's a remnant. According to what Paul is going to write in Romans 11, all Israel shall be saved. Hmm. Let's hold it. Let's hold it for a minute here. And he will set up an ensign for the nations and will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And then people are all running around saying, oh, that's modern days today. No, it's not. That ensign that he's going to set up, if you very look at the very words there, venasu nes laguin. That ensign is raised up on a pole. That was Jesus Christ in his crucifixion. He's telling you what the sign would be of that time. And he would assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, every, that's, what, that's what throws everybody right there. Judah and Israel. But yet, if you just go to the book of Acts, chapter 2, not only did we have up here in, uh, you know, we have here, you know, when they're all gathered together on the day of Pentecost in the upper room there, the Spirit of God filled them, appeared before them, cloven tongues like as of a fire, sat upon each of them. This was Judah, by the way, in that upper room. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. But when you get down to verse 36... Peter, when he's standing up before the whole congregation, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. There's the ensign. There's the house of Israel. Judah was in the upper room. Judah comes out staggering in the house of Israel. What in the world is going on? The house of Israel, those are from all those nations. You know, they were Medes, Elamites, Judea, Pontus, Asia, Philgria, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. In other words, Judeans and their proselytes included with them. Cretes, Arabians, I mean, everything you could think of was there. And what did the scriptures say? He's going to raise up an ensign on a pole and he will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Did it happen? Sure it did. Also another scripture for the remnant, Jeremiah 23 and 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries whether I have driven them and will bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and multiply. 
I will set up shepherds over them who shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed neither shall any be lacking saith the Lord. And that's exactly the way Jesus set it up. He put shepherds over the flock. He said smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Hmm. Also Zechariah in chapter uh, 8, verses 6 to 8, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be a marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people, again, a remnant in those days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west. I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Again, go look at the day of Acts on the day of Pentecost there, Acts chapter 2. You will see but from the, both the east, the west, north and the south, they came back home to hear the wonderful works of God. In fact, the wonderful works of God, this is a scripture that clearly was fulfilled. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts in those days. The ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations. Vehiziku bekanaf ish Yehudi. They shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. That's what it says. But it says the sleeve, the wing of the man Ish. And I love it. It's not Adam. It's a man with the fire of Almighty God inside of him. That's why it says Ish. We will go with you. Nelecha imchem. But that's a plural, Steve. Nelecha, we will go imchem with you, plural. Ki shamanu, because we have heard. Elohim imchem, God is with you. But they took the hold of the wing of that Jewish man. But then they said, we'll go with you. That's what the house of Israel did when they saw the 120 come out of the upper room. They had already heard about him in Syria when they took a hold, and it literally in the scripture says they took a hold of the hem of his garment, and it says, Bikanaf, his wing, not his seat. And by the way, in the Hebrew Matthew, the woman that touched the hem of his garment, it says tzitzit. But when he went over to Syria, they took his kanaf. They heard about it. We've heard. We'll go with you. That's when they were all gathered. Remember what Jesus did? When Jesus was here, he says to his apostles, go only into the sheep, lost sheep of what? The house of Israel. The house of Israel is not lost, my friends. They were indeed there on the day of Pentecost. But what were they? They were not all the house of Israel. I'd actually even made that mistake again. God corrected, corrected me and showed me that the tri ten tribes were not lost. But then I made the foolish error of thinking that all the house of Israel had gotten saved then. That would kind of be goofy in a way to even think of that because if there's a remnant of Judah today, which are the Pharisees and a lot of the Orthodox uh, or secular and non-secular Jews today in Israel and all around the world, then surely the house of Israel still has to be here as well. Wow. That's interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Romans, let's continue in 11 here. 
And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. Well, that's a tongue twister, right? What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. That's the remnant. And the rest were blind or blinded. The rest were blinded. And you know, the rest are what most of the churches follow today. Remember that famous passage? Let me see if I can find it for you real quick. I, I, I love this one here, right? Blind lead the blind. Matthew 15, 14. Let me just, we'll make it big enough. We won't worry about trying to go over to anything else. Let's just make it bigger here. Let them alone. But we, let's, let's go look for But he answered and he said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted, it shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch, into the ditch. Romans 11 says, The election hath obtained it. The apostles, the 3,000 that came on, you know, on the day of Pentecost, the, the, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands that followed him that believed upon Jesus, etc. That was the election. And the rest were blinded. So the people that have held to Judaism until this day, and as Nehemiah Gordon clearly says, and also Tovia Singer clearly says, that the Orthodox Jews of today have to be able to, in order to be an Orthodox rabbi, you have to be able to prove your lineage back to the Pharisees. Well, if they can do that, then they definitely were the blinded ones. Well, where are you going with this, brother? See, well, Revelation chapter 3 and verse, and we're talking about the latest in church. It says in verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, Increased with goods and have need of nothing. And know us not, you are wretched, you're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's the church. So when the Zionist churches, and God bless your heart if you're in there and just don't have any knowledge or know any better. I trust God will open your eyes. If you're the pastor, I pray God will open your eyes. Because Jesus said, when the blind lead the blind, when you're thinking like Paula White made that comment, her famous statement, we got a lot to learn from the Jews. Listen, I love my people, but I'm not going to follow them. I want to be the one leading them to the eye salve of Jesus Christ to open their eyes. And not only are they blind, but they're naked as well. You see, Adam, when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, one thing that did happen, their eyes came open. And they realized they were naked. The nakedness was the fact they were in a human body of flesh. They had a downgrade. Their upgrade is when they were one. Man, God created man in the Garden of Eden in the beginning. And he put, they give them, them dominion over the fish, over the birds, over the animals, over everything. When they came into a body of flesh, that's kind of a downgrade. That's a lot deeper subject than what we can get into here. But do a little homework on that idea. Anyway, they're not only blind, but now they're naked. But they don't even know it. 
Jesus said, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may be able to see. By the way, that white raiment, friends, is when you have put on the marriage garment. When you've entered into the bridal chamber with Jesus Christ, and your eyes are open. That's what that is. That's what that is. All right, let's move on. Going back to Romans, we'll continue to read. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber eyes, that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. If you look at Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get you out of your country, from your kindred, from thy father's house into the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make thy name great, and be thou a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, Abraham. That's a singular you, by the way. And in these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, he says, I'll bless you, bless them that bless you, and him that curses you, I will curse. And again, plain as day, can't get around it. There's the you, and there's the you. And it's singular. He didn't say, I will bless those that bless y'all, okay, and curse them that curse y'all. It was to Abraham and Abraham alone. It was passed from Abraham to Isaac and from Isaac to Jacob. And the only reason it was passed to them, because why? Bringing forth the promised seed. Now here's where that jealousy will come from. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In you. What was in him? The seed, the promised seed was in him. And that promised seed was going to bless all the earth. That's what provokes the Jews to jealousy is when they begin to recognize that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that passage. And they begin to see the Gentiles have believed on him before they did. And it should have been the blessing was to them first. Well, the remnant did get it first. The Gentiles did get it second. But there is a group still waiting for the rest of it. So we continue on in the book of Romans. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles insomuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify in mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation, which the same word is jealousy, can be used either way, them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. How is he trying to provoke them to jealousy? For I speak to you Gentiles. His very speech of the gospel and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. He was hoping would provoke some of them because he knows a remnant is supposed to believe. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? But life 
from the dead. That is when we get into the prophecy of Ezekiel 37. Therefore prophesy. Let's, let's, let's look at this. We'll just use a little of this. Say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people. That was 2,000 years ago. Jesus did. The graves did open up according to Matthew chapter 28. And many of those that slept in the earth, they came up from the, out of the dust in the earth and they mingled with the living. And the living knew it not. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. Remember after his resurrection, he breathed on his apostles. He said, receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. I will place you in your own land. They literally, when they rose up from the grave, they were in their own land. But that own land is not just the physical Israel. He brought them back to the land of promise in Christ Jesus, in the Messiah, the Mashiach himself. Hmm. Boy, this gets better and better all the time. I'll put sinew on you. I'll, he said, I heard the bones rattling, a great noise and everything. You know the prophecy. We continue on to Romans from there all the way down to verse 25. For if the first root be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches be broken off, thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and them bear, partake us of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if you boast, you bear us not the root, but the root you, thee. Thou will say then, branches, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take he lest he also spare it not you. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. And if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will, shall be cut off. And if they, all, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. The blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Well, what is that fullness? If you go to Luke 21, Jesus also speaks of this. Make sure I'm in the right spot here. Luke 21. Yep. Okay. And then we're going to verse, well, I just put Luke 21. Oh, here we go. I want you to notice where it's at in Luke, because it's going to mirror Matthew 24. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, or to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive to all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. 2,000 years Israel has been trodden down by the Gentiles. And even though there is a people there today and they have become a nation again, they're just at war. You see, the scripture is about to be fulfilled, but it's not going to be fulfilled the way you think. It's not going to be that suddenly 
Notice, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars are upon the earth, the stress of nations or perplexity, the sea and the waves are roaring. When the Gentiles' times is fulfilled, it's only going to get worse. Men's hearts will fail them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verse 26, so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. You see, there's still more to come. What we're going to do now, though, we're going to turn to the apocalypse of Peter. This is where we find out a little bit more about what's going to happen. In chapter 2, it reads this here, and this is not a canonical book. This is an apocryphal book. But it reads here, And you learn a parable from the fig tree. As soon as its shoots have come forth, and the twigs grown, the end of the world shall come. Notice what's going to happen when the fig tree puts forth its shoots. The end of the world shall come. Just like what we read in Luke when the fullness of the Gentiles has come, is pretty much the end of the world. And I, Peter, answered and said to him, Interpret the fig tree to me. How can we understand it? For throughout all the days this fig tree sends forth shoots, and every year it brings forth its fruit for its master. When then does the parable of the fig tree, what does it mean? We do not know. And the master answered and said to me, Do you not understand that the fig tree is the house of of Israel. It is like a man who planted a fig tree in his garden and he brought forth no fruit. Remember what happened when Jesus saw the fig tree and it didn't bring forth fruit? He cursed it. Think about that. When you go around saying whoever curses Israel will be cursed, whoever blesses it will be blessed. Israel is a type of the fig tree. He cursed, he said, let it bring forth fruit no more. Just a thought. Think about it. Now, I do believe all Israel shall be saved. But it's not all that natural Israel. It's all that's called to be saved. Because Jesus said, all that the Heavenly Father has given me will come to me and none of them will be left out. Okay? And he sought the fruit for many years. And when he did not find it and said to the keeper of his garden, uproot this fig tree so that it does not make our ground unfruitful. And the gardener said to his master, let us rid it of weeds and dig uh, the ground around about it and water it. And if it, then it does not bear fruit, we will straightway uproot it from the garden and plant another in the place of it. Have you not understood that the fig tree is the house of Israel? Verily I say to you, when its twigs have sprouted forth in the last days, then shall false Christ come and awake expectations. Expectation. Notice, false Christ, false anointed ones, plural, will come. They awake expectations, saying, I am the Christ who has now come into the world. One of them, singular, Christ, is going to come and say he's that Messiah. When they perceive the wickedness of their deeds, they shall turn away and deny him whom our fathers praised. The first Christ whom they crucified and therein sinned a great sin. But this deceiver is not the Christ. And when they reject him, he shall slay them with the sword and there shall be many martyrs. Then shall the twigs of the fig tree, that is the house of Israel, shoot forth. Many shall become martyrs at his hand. Enoch and Elijah will be sent to teach them that this is the deceiver who must come into the world and do signs and wonders in order to deceive and therefore those who die by his hand shall be martyrs and shall be reckoned among the good and righteous martyrs who have pleased God in their life. The house of Israel is saved right at the end. At the time of the coming, the house of Israel fulfillment of Romans 11 is going to be fulfilled at the time of the coming of the Antichrist. 
And it's the two witnesses. They actually recognize that he's the Antichrist. But notice, they're all going to die. That's Revelation. That's the third, uh, fifth seal. We'll go into that in just a moment. But before we do, I want to read to you, because I said to you, it's just like what he said there in Luke 21, the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, is very similar to that of Matthew 24. Verse 15, the Hebrew Matthew says, something we don't have in the Greek, this is the Antichrist and this is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place. Let the one who reads understand. Then, then those who are in Judea, let them flee to the mountains. He who is on the house, not let him not come down to take anything out of his house. He who is in the field, let him not turn back to get his garment. Woe to those who are pregnant in those days and the children in those days. Uh, or nurse children in those days. Pray to God that your flight not be on the Sabbath day, because then will be great distress, which has not been from the creation of the world until now, and, and, and as will not be, except those days where few flesh should not be saved. For the sake of the chosen, those days will be few. All right, now, the point I wanted to make, though, is that the Antichrist, and it's just like the time of Luke, and there he is, ze antichristas, ve ze shakuts uh, shama, the Antichrist. This is he, the abomination of desolation. So the Antichrist himself comes, and that's exactly what we learn from the apocalypse of Peter. The Antichrist comes, declares himself thus, but the house of Israel that wakes up will not believe that he is the Messiah. Instead, they embrace Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And as a result, as a result, what happens to them? Revelation chapter 6 and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. That's, that's, that's the remnant of Israel and Judah back in the days of when Jesus was on earth. And they believed after his resurrection and they died, for they, they died as martyrs. And white robes were given to every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Under the fifth seal, the last days, the martyrs of Revelation, uh, of the fifth seal in Revelation chapter 6 verse 11 is none other than the house of Israel. Just like the two witnesses of Revelation 11 though, these are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks. I've always believed that it was Moses and Elijah. But if the apocalypse of Peter is accurate, it's Elijah and Enoch. I always held to Moses and Elijah for one reason, and that is the gifts that are shown here in Revelation 11 are identical to the gifts that they had. And they are the two olive branches on the two sides of the golden lampstand. And of course, they stood by Jesus, which to me was my, my thought on that. So I, I don't know the, the complete accuracy of, of the apocalypse of Peter, but I'm perfectly okay with Elijah and Enoch. Doesn't make any difference to me which two it is. If any man will hurt them, fire proceed out of their mouth, devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues of the nation shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to put, be put into graves. I've always said the reason why I've had a lot of people speak on this since I've spoke about this, but the reason why their dead bodies are left in the street is to prove that Jesus Christ truly did raise from the dead. This time, they don't even bury them. They see it, and now they know the resurrection is for real. They send the gifts because the two prophets tormented them. 
but great fear fell on them when they saw him stand to their feet. Talk about a resurrection of the dead then. Let me tell you something. You want to get that resurrection now. Get born again. Go to the message I did on being born again. That's what you need. In fact, also too, I want to make one other statement in closing. I remember when I did the message about being born again, I talked about intrusive thoughts. And I talked about, you know, laying the axe to the root of the tree when you pull those roots up. When the roots are pulled up, the plant dies. The way you uproot sin out of your life, just prayerfully from your heart. Every time you're going through that battle, say, Father, pull it up by the roots. I'm, I'm laying it out. I got this problem more. I'm ripping it up by the roots. I'm confessing it to you. I laid that sin out before you so it's dried up and dies from the root. Don't dare water it either and don't put it back in the ground. Keep it pulled up until it's dead. That's how you get born again. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support of this work that we do here. God bless you. You can support us. IsraeliNewsLive.org is our website. Um, you can donate right here. Donate by mail or donate online. Online is much quicker. We appreciate it greatly. Your stand and your support uh, for this ministry here. And, uh, you know, there's always new videos popping up on our website as well. Our YouTube channel, Israeli News Live, where you're watching this now. And Patreon. By the way, if you are a member on Patreon or if you want to become one, all of our members, you still will be uh, at your same place you are now. But starting in October, on October the 1st, we are going to increase our minimum donation, not by much, just for a few dollars there. But we need your help. We really do need it. I wouldn't ask you if it wasn't certainly a need in our lives that we need your help to support this ministry. If you appreciate the truth and what we say, you know we don't mince words. We don't play around. We really, from my heart, I tell you every bit of the truth that I possibly can. Support the work we do. Become a patron as well. We just, we've loaded, I've made that promise, a commitment to do one in-depth look on things every week, giving you more information. This weekend, we got Colonel Greg coming on. That type of message, you get the sneak peek over there. You get to see it for a couple of days there before it comes here to Israeli News Live. But we, those in-depth looks like Planet X have had over a thousand views already. Those are exclusive to our patrons. And, uh, uh, you know, so I just really encourage you because that's just a way to keep us going. Thank you. God bless you. We love you. Uh, and, and definitely take a look at the video we just did here today. Urgent request. Accountability must be a priority. Uh, it's, been up, it's only been up a little over an hour, 1,200 views. Thank you for those that are listening to this video. And please... Help us out with it. God bless you. Have a great evening. Stephen Benin with Israeli News Live.